The fictional tempo is likewise far less consistent than it is made out to be. Udolfo is typically characterised as slow going, no doubt because Radcliffe so often stops the action, as we've seen, to indulge in extravagant pictorialism. She undoubtedly sought by such passages to achieve in prose the same visionary effects that she admired in the works of the 17th century landscape painters Salvatore Rosa, Claude and Poussin. As Sir Walter Scott wrote in his commentary on Radcliffe in Lives of Eminent Novelists and Dramatists, 1824, her landscapes resemble, quote, splendid and beautiful fancy pictures, end quote. Even when not depicting nature, she is inclined to bring the plot to a standstill when a chance for a striking tableau presents itself. The effect is one of suspended animation of bodies frozen in painterly attitudes. Elsewhere, Radcliffe's characters seem to get stuck in a sort of narrative Mobius strip inside which they can only perform the same repetitive gestures over and over. The analogy here may be with the obsessional standing in place found in opera. When Emily and Valancourt have to separate at the end of volume one, for example, but cannot bring themselves to make the move, they indeed resemble lovers in Italian grand opera, planted in position unable to do anything but repeat their stylized adios for close to three pages. That happens in volume one of chapter 13, and it's quoting pages 158 to 60 in this edition. As in operatic representation, the effect of stasis can only be broken, it seems, by a sudden exaggerated movement. After one last embrace, Valancourt abruptly hastens away, stage left, while Emily runs off in the opposite direction. One can almost see the end of act curtain coming down. And yet, precisely at those moments when one would most expect a set piece, some grand painterly tableau or operatic showstopper, Radcliffe unaccountably hurries on by. Then her narrative rushes forward, helter-skelter, as if to make up for its previous moments of dawdling. When it comes to Adolfo's themes, the novel's underlying structure of meaning, similar paradoxes prevail. Since the 19th century critics have labelled Radcliffe's fiction a romance, that is, a work with little or no connection to real life. Not for Radcliffe, wrote Scott, the stark moral and psychological realism of Samuel Richardson's Clarissa, her characters belong rather to romance than to real life. Comparing Udolpho disparagingly with Wilkie Collins' The Woman in White, 1860, Henry James found Radcliffe's far-flung settings and exotic situations painfully irrelevant to modern experience. Quote, to Mr Collins belongs the credit of having introduced into fiction those most mysterious of mysteries, the mysteries which are at our own doors. This innovation gave a new impetus to the literature of horrors. It was fatal to the authority of Mrs Radcliffe and her everlasting castle in the Apennines. What are the Apennines to us, or we to the Apennines? Instead of the terrors of Udolpho, we we were treated to the terrors of the cheerful country house and the busy London lodgings. And there is no doubt that these were infinitely the more terrible. Mrs Radcliffe's mysteries were romances pure and simple, while those of Mr Wilkie Collins were stern reality. End quote. That's taken from um, Henry James, as I say, and that is the work is named Literary Criticism, American Writers, English Writers, published by the Library of America in 1984. James, too, invoked the genius of Richardson. The woman in white is the kind of 19th century version of Clarissa Harlow. The Apennines just could not compete 